All right, welcome back to another Nano Studio 2 tutorial. And this is going to be another uh, production tip tutorial. It will kind of be a companion to the previous tutorial, which we looked at EQing kick drums. So the companion to that is usually compressing kick drums. So the reason you would normally compress a kick drum is to sort of add punch to it. You know, in some cases, compression is used to tame dynamics, but really with kick drums, just isolating the kick itself, it's usually done to just add punch to what maybe is a little bit of a dull or lifeless sounding kick. So a lot of people might think, why not just use the envelope to shape the kick, the amplitude of the kick? It's kind of the same thing as a compressor, right? And you have more control. Well, that's true, but actually it doesn't act exactly like compressor. An envelope has a very almost like a linear way of affecting the amplitude of a kick. So the way I usually use a compressor is, well, the first thing I would do is I would use the envelope, such as the envelope you'd find in Slate here. I would first use the envelope to sort of uh, either dull the attack a little bit with the attack here, or basically to trim down, if it's a, in the case of a long kick, uh, just trim it down with a with the decay, right? That's, that's what I would do. Um, but when it comes to punch, you're not really going to be able to as easily get the results you're looking for, I find, with an envelope versus a compressor. So anyways, once I get the envelope how I like it, I go to the uh, kick drum compressor. I'll just use an insert effect here, a little bit easier to follow. And as I mentioned in the last video, I always go for extreme settings. So the first thing I, I look at when adding punch to a kick with a compressor is the attack characteristic. So for a kick drum, the attack is mainly, it's going to be in the 10 milliseconds to maybe 30 milliseconds or 40 milliseconds range. I kind of default to around 25, 30. So set the attack to that. Jack up the ratio just to make it really a pronounced effect. Uh, you can leave the release around 100 milliseconds. And then ride down the threshold considerably. There you go. You can just hear the just the the attack, and that's what we want. We want to see how we're affecting how the compressor is affecting the attack. And the next thing you're going to want to do is ride the attack itself with the compressor to to sort of shape that the way you want to. See how that changes the attack? I have to really jack it up to get you to hear that, maybe. And then the more attack I add you get more of that post-attack, the post-click uh, character of the uh, kick. So I, maybe I kind of like it around there for this kick drum. So now I start uh, making these other parameters and more, putting these other parameters in more reasonable uh, ranges. So I'm going to ride the makeup way down. And the threshold... I'm mainly looking at the meter, see how much I'm really affecting. I don't like to go too crazy. Maybe minus five, minus six, something like that. And the ratio, I tend not to care about too much. I'm not going to worry about explaining ratio too much. Um, this is basically how much it clamps down. And uh, the higher the ratio, almost the more of a quick or square clamping. So if you want almost like a softer clamping, uh, you, you can go for a, a lighter ratio, in which case you will want to ride down the threshold much. But as you can probably hear, it doesn't really affect the sound too much. So in this case, uh, just a single kick drum. So whatever, I'll keep the ratio around the usual 4 to 1. Around there. And again, the, uh, the release is not something you're going to tend to get too much mileage from unless there's... Um, Unless it's just basically releasing too quickly or too slowly. And you can see with the indicator here, basically, if it's releasing within the time frame you expect between the kicks, that's usually where you should set the release to. And I just realized I placed the compressor here actually by accidentally between these two EQs. So I'm actually going to place it after that EQ. And this leads me to an important point, which is after you compress a kick, and this is very much uh, almost like a special case scenario with, with compressing kicks, is you lose a lot of bass definition. You know, see, I'll, I'll take 
the compressor off here. See how much more bass comes through? But you also lose punch, right? And we that's why we're using the compressor to add that punch. So we got the punch, we're using, losing some bass. So obviously what you do then, I always like to add a little bit of bass back with post EQ, you know, after the compression. So let's just do that. So the low shelf. There we go, we get that bass back and we get a little bit more punchiness because of the compression. And if, you know, you, you feel that there's too much bass now or less punch, then you can always modify or just sort of micro tune these parameters. And speaking of micro tuning, um, another thing you might do is, or you might hear other people recommend, is parallel compression. And parallel compression is really simple. Basically, it's taking the uncompressed signal and mixing it in with a compressed signal and sort of modifying how much dry or wet vari variation of that that you like. And this is done for a number of reasons. Some people might think, well, why bother with mixing compressed with uncompressed when you can just, uh, you know, ride down your compression settings, essentially affecting the mix level of the compression doing that. Uh, but actually, there's a, a lot of good reasons why it's not going to achieve the same result. Uh, you know, examples such as uh, compression can bring out certain harmonic distortion in sounds, so sort of a saturated sound, or, or that sort of um, heavily compressed pump or, or punch. Uh, and you can't really easily get that. And maybe you want to have that punch, that distortion, that compression, but kind of you also want to clean it up a bit and make it a little bit more transparent. That's how you'd use parallel compression. I typically use parallel compression on uh, complete drum tracks, not usually on individual instruments such as a kick drum. Um, but actually you have the option sort of in Nano Studio 2 with just this one knob here uh, where basically you can treat the... Uh, the kick mix between the uncompressed signal and the, uh, the compressed. It's a little subtle, a little hard to hear, but with this one, you get a little bit uh, more of that compression. Whereas with this, it sort of, the, the uncompressed signal seems to come through more almost results in a lengthier sounding kick. A little bit less punch, but you do preserve that bass. So that's another thing you might want to consider. So we got a compressed kick. We wanted more punch to it. And, um, you know, usually you're not going to compress a kick in isolation. You're going to compress it relative to the other instruments going on your track to try to give it more definition and to sit in your mix better, right? Um, so sometimes compression alone won't get you there. And I find that a good tool to reach for that a lot of people will tell you is not a, a good idea is actually to stick a limiter on, on the, uh, the kick. Effectively because the kick is the most highest energy content instrument in, in a song, typically, right? It's going to take up the most space. It's going to be the, the thing that gives you the most headache when mastering or, you know, making sure you have enough headroom with your final mix. So usually if you limit it even by a few dB, you gave yourself a lot more headroom. Uh, it sort of helps the kick stand out in the mix a little bit better. Again, you get a little bit of that harmonic distortion, which helps the kick uh, cut through the mix a bit better. And if you don't overdo it, and even in cases where you overdo it, such as with dubstep and some more sort of distorted sounding genres, you can get some really interesting effects. But anyways, I'll tell you how I typically use a limiter to sort of fatten up a kick and give it a little bit more definition. So for the most transparent usage of a limiter on a kick, uh, I recommend keeping the attack all the way down, the release all the way down, hold all the way down. And depending on how much you know how how much you want it to sound like an effect versus a very transparent sort of just attenuation of the output um, is determined by how much you ride the threshold. So, you don't, you know, don't have much of a threshold at all if you kind of just want it to be almost inaudible, really. You know, actually here it shows what we're getting, minus 2, minus, uh, minus 0.2 or minus 0.9 uh, gain reduction, which, you know, isn't going to be 
terribly audible. And look ahead, I keep it around two milliseconds. Um, it's basically, it helps. Basically, the look ahead, it helps with that, you know, the transients and, and getting a little bit less uh, awkward distortion on transients. The better the look, the higher the look ahead, the more the algorithm can figure that out better. Um, but the higher the look ahead you use, the more that that's added to latency. Um, so if you use a lot of limiters with a lot of, you know, you, you add all that look ahead. If you uh, use two milliseconds and you have eight instances, that's 16 milliseconds. That latency is added to the output. Um, which you might notice, I guess, if you're performing in real time. And it'll be a little bit more intensive, I guess, on resources. I'm not entirely sure about that, but I think so. So I usually keep look at at two milliseconds. And then, you know, if I want to add a little bit more limiter as an effect, I just ride the threshold. See how I'm getting that distortion. Still, because the release and the attack is so quick, it's actually... It's, uh, it's not creating too much of a dramatic squashing effect, you know? So when people tell you limiters shouldn't be used in this instance, you know, trust your ears. That's the most important thing. Don't necessarily trust what gearheads tell you is the right or the wrong way to do things. Because, um, you know, there are rules out there for reasons, but uh, there's many instances where you can break those rules. That being said, I like to usually beef up kicks with a bit of limiting, but not go too crazy usually to give myself a little more headroom. Minus 3 dB is about average. So I've definitely given that kick now with compression and limiting, uh, a little bit more body, a little bit of that harmonic distortion, just a little bit more punch to hopefully sit my mix better. And I guess the other uh, aspect of compression that I want to touch on that's common in, in my production is uh, using a side chain uh, coming from the kick to a bass track in order to um, basically not to get that pumping sound that you often hear in tracks that we talked about in a previous video, but just to sort of move the bass out of the way of the kick in a subtle way, pretty much in a transparent way that's not audible to the listener, but that you know the kick and the bass are playing better with each other. So to demonstrate that, I just have this bass line I came up with that's sort of in the same frequency range as the kick, so it's easy for them to get muddled together. All right, so in order to move this bass out of the way a little bit, what I do is I take that kick as a single kick on the track, and I side chain it, send it to, well actually first I need to set up a compressor on the bass, right? That's how we side chain. So I've got a compressor now set up on, on the bass track, don't worry about the settings just yet. And I'll send the kick to that compressor. What we really want to do is just sort of move it out of the way. So what we're going to do is we don't want to preserve the attack, but that's going to interfere with the kick. Remember, we're only dealing with about 30 milliseconds of that initial attack anyway, so you want to definitely move the bass out of the way right away. So move that all the way down to one millisecond. And again, depending on the timing of your, your song, you probably don't want to fiddle with this too much, but you know, 80 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds is pretty common. Keep it around there. And with the threshold, we're really looking only to move the bass out of the way in a subtle way. Again, maybe three decibels in this case. So you see we're getting that three decibels of gain reduction on the bass, but you're not really hearing any pumping or it's pretty transparent. But the bass definitely can play along better and consequently you can, you can move up the bass in gain because now you have a little more headroom where, where those kicks peaks are. All right. All right, so that's just a quick video detailing how I like to use compression on kick drums. Uh, and you may want to go back and look at the video on EQing kick drums uh, in order to hopefully get kicks to cut through as much as possible. All right, so thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next video.